Hello again, welcome back. So we continue our analysis of point patterns and we now move from the global perspective that we just covered in the K function to a local perspective in the local K function and the local joint counts. And just as a refresher, first I'll uh, reiterate because this was covered at length in the intro spatial data science course what I mean by the local perspective and then outline the local version of the K function and then its counterpart in a sense in a lattice setup which is the local joint count statistic and then close with a brief comparison of the two on the snow data for cholera in London. So what is this local perspective? As I've mentioned a number of times now there is a major difference between clustering which is a global perspective like global spatial autocorrelation or the clustering suggested by a k function or one of the letter functions. Uh, it tells us something about the characteristics of the point pattern but it doesn't tell us anything about where the clusters might be and after all that's really what this course is about. So when we're interested in cluster detection we want to find where they are what is the location and what is their significance if we can. We will see some measures that use significance and then others that don't that uh, come more from the machine learning tradition in a few lectures. So this concept of a local indicator of spatial association or ELISA that I um, proposed a number of years ago means that there is a statistic for each location and also that the sum of the leases is connected to a global statistic. Now that's more of a technical requirement but the key thing is that we have a statistic for each point or each location and we can assess its significance. That is the essence of the idea behind ELISA. And um, so it does two things. Um, it finds out which locations have a significant statistic and then it interprets the result in terms of either the presence of clusters or the presence of spatial outliers. Now spatial clusters are will be points that are similar. Uh, spatial outliers are points that are very different from their neighbors. We won't focus on that too much now. We'll get back to outliers uh, later on but that's the essence uh, of this statistic and the, the most commonly used LISA is the local Moran statistic and uh, a couple of lectures from now we'll look at how the local Moran statistic is adjusted for dealing with rates or proportions but that is uh, you should be familiar with the concept of a local Moran statistic uh, at this point. So um, What's important though is that it's not just a local Moran statistic. There's many, many local statistics. In fact, every time you have a global statistic that is some scaling factor times a sum over each observation of some expression and typically this will be this component will be a sum over J over the neighbors or something like that. But anytime a global statistic is, is constructed like this and we've already seen some that are and I'll get back to that in a few minutes then the local statistic is just simply the component. Okay, So that's the idea. Every time you see a double sum, sum over i, sum over j then you know take out the sum over i what's left is the local statistic. Of course the challenge then is to figure out how to carry out inference for this local statistic which is not always that straightforward. So what's the local k then? Well let's go back to our global k. The, actually the idea of the local k came out of point pattern analysis originally and um, it was really formulated um, by Geddes and Geddes and Franklin in the context of looking at the scale of interaction. So basically what happens through these measures of interaction when the phenomena are studied at different scales. We won't focus on that here. What I'm going to do here 
is recast this local k function that's been around for a while, uh, actually from well before the notion of ELISA was proposed, I'm going to recast it as a special case of ELISA. And we can remember what I just said. Anytime you have a statistic that is a double sum over i and j, we're in business. And in fact, as we saw in the previous lecture, the global k is, here's the inverse intensity and then an average over all the points except the one that we're considering. For every one of these points i, we compute this expression. So we can rewrite this as some rescaling times sum over i times a component in the terminology that I just used a few slides ago. So then naturally this component either with or without the scalar factor. So since the scaling factor has nothing to do with i, we might as well ignore it. It really doesn't matter. It might help for interpretation and for comparability to keep the scaling factor in there. But for statistical properties, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is actually this part, the sum over j of this count of number of points within a given radius. And we can compute that for each point separately, of course, for a given radius. And that is the local k for that point and for that radius. So everything is a function of this radius that we use, but we compute this for each point, And that is our expression. As I mentioned earlier, we can keep the scaling factor or we can drop it. It doesn't really matter. So then how do we carry out inference for this? It's not that simple, you know, in the, in the k function analysis, we simulated the full spatial pattern and then recomputed the k function for each of these. But if you have a single point, you can't really simulate the full spatial pattern. It doesn't quite work that way. So we go the analytical route where again Poisson is our friend and it tells us exactly how many points we can expect um, given uh, the intensity of the process and this is the area of the circle. So we can find out um, what is the probability of having given the intensity and given the radius, the size of the radius, what is the probability of having a given number of points for that radius. So we can compute that and uh, that gives us a way to carry out inference. It's imperfect. There is one big problem with this, which you may recall from the discussion of local spatial autocorrelation in the other course, is the problem of multiple comparisons, is that there is a statistic for each point, so the p-values will not be independent and will be affected. So a major challenge is how to come up with reasonable uh, p-values for this instance. So what's a local joint count? Now we switch gears. Remember, in a point pattern analysis, we only have the events. We don't have the non-events. Now we switch gears and we say, well, what if we had the non-events? So we have a lattice data set, and for each location, we have either whether the event happened, and so x at i is 1, or the event did not happen, and x at i is 0. And this is a, an old problem. Uh, in fact, Cliff and Ord, in their classic treatment of spatial autocorrelation, talked about this and they um, advanced this notion of a join count. So it's a count of joins. Basically, what you count is how many times a B and a B are next to each other. So by convention, one is B is black and zero is white. Of course, you can flip this around or you could call it red and blue, whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. It's just a convention. So when you have B and B next to each other, so the join is the boundary, the border that separates them, then you count that as a BB join. And same for two zeros being in adjoining locations or a zero and a one being adjoining locations.
location. So BB and WW stand for positive spatial autocorrelation because they're the same thing. BW stands for negative spatial autocorrelation because a, a one is next to a zero and vice versa. And for practical purposes, we always take the smallest fraction as the ones. Otherwise, you get some funky results. So what is the statistic then? The Cliff and Ord um, global joint count statistic. Uh, there's one for each of the three combinations. So there's a BB, a WW, and a BW. But since we take the convention of using the smallest fraction as X equal one, we focus on the BB statistic. So um, counting all the joints, if the joints are one and one, that is the same as counting the product of X at I and X at J. So if they're both one, the product will be one. Counting this for the neighbors. And here we're back with our spatial weights. Um, this time they're binary. So they're one when I and J are neighbors and zero when they're not neighbors. So even though this may look like a fairly complex expression, what is actually going on here is that we sum over all the other observations, but only those where WIJ is one and both XI and XJ are one. And in fact, this is counting the joints. Actually, it's counting them twice because it counts each pair separately. So oftentimes this is divided by two. For our purposes, it doesn't matter because we're back with our friend, a double sum, a sum over I and a sum over J. So this is the component which will be the local statistic. So then in a paper fairly recently, Jun Li and I advanced this notion of a local uh, joint count statistic. Actually, it was advanced in some of my earlier work, but it was worked out uh, in this recent paper. And so the idea is to have only where x of i is 1, we take the sum of how many neighbors are also 1. So that's in essence what it boils down to. For, so for every location, you have to define the neighbors in some way using the spatial weights matrix, say using a distance band, and then we're getting very close to this notion of a local k, which also uses a distance band. Um, and, and then within that distance band, we count how many neighbors are actually one. So we have our statistic. The next challenge is how do we do inference? Um, we're not quite there yet. So the event surrounded by neighboring events more so than under randomness. We observe both events and non-events. So we interpret this as a cluster of events. Now the inference, uh, we can, if we are, you know, put our blinders on and forget about multiple comparisons and all that kind of stuff, we can do a hypergeometric distribution. Um, this is very easy to do, but my preference is to do a conditional permutation, which is a, basically a simulation approach. We uh, mimic drawing neighbors and see what is the distribution of the joint counts for a random redrawing of neighbors and then base the statistic on that. So it's all pretty straightforward. Um, both the local K and the local joint count, in essence, boil down to counting the number of neighbors, quote unquote neighbors, within a given distance radius. Now, what's the difference between the two? Of course, there's a huge difference between the two. And the difference is the, the data situation. And here we're back with the classic um, um, snow data set. And on the left, this one is the 1984 data set from snow, which only has the addresses of the deaths. Here's the Broad Street Pump. And here's a, a data set which was just a few um, years later prepared by the Board of Health. There's a whole literature about this snow analysis and 
who analyzed what and for what reason. So uh, the, the actual purpose of this particular analysis what was to see whether the cholera disease could be um, caused by fumes coming out of grates from the sewer. And so they luckily went and collected information for every different address and then coded or we coded as one the addresses where there was at least one death. The original data set actually has the number of deaths at each house, which you could also uh, analyze uh, using actually a regular local Moran statistic. But we just simplified it here to make the two comparable. So on the right is our full lattice death. You see all the little white circles are houses without, without any deaths. And then here we only have the deaths. We don't have the non-deaths. So first we're going to do the local K and we use our um, Poisson distribution approximation. We have a given distance band, so we only have to do it for one R. We can compute the, um, the density on average, and then we just have the, the P values. And what we find is that out of, so here, the, the empty circles are deaths but they are deaths that are not in a cluster. The clusters are the red dots. And we have, out of the 369 points, we have 98 that are significant in using the local K. And interestingly, just as an aside, they are not right around the Broad Street pump, which is a totally different story, but it's kind of not your usual story. And then here is our local joint count statistic where the... Um, red ones are the significant locations, the blue ones are the deaths that are not significant, and then the white ones are the non-deaths. Uh, of course, they can't be significant. So we have, I mean, you could say, well, it's pretty similar, but it's not quite the same. Like here, we do pick up a cluster around the Broad Street pump that we didn't have before. And just out of curiosity, this is a, um, co-location map and the, the red points are the ones that are significant in both cases. The blue points are the ones that are significant for one statistic and not the other. And then the white ones are the ones that were not significant in, in, in any of them. So we have a, a co-location of 72 out of 98, 97. So there is some correspondence between the two, but it's not total. So each of them um, contribute their own perspective. And uh, in essence, it's comparing apples and oranges because um, in, in this, uh, the second data set, the one we analyzed, uh, you can do it both ways. You could ignore the addresses where there are no deaths and do a local K, which is in essence what the local K does, or we can take them, take them into account. But with this original SNOW data set, where you only have deaths, you can't do it both ways. You can only do it one way. So what is the comparison between the two? It is that um, local K uh, basically counts the points that you have in an area of a circle with a uniform Poisson process. The local joint counts also counts the neighbors, but it's not in a full circle. And it's a much narrower set of potential locations. But they both go at the same idea and replace this notion of a global assessment of the pattern to a focus on specific locations, on specific clusters. And um, so that uh, kind of concludes our discussion of traditional point pattern analysis, where we went from just description to finding interesting locations where the number of points in an area didn't match what one would expect under spatial randomness, to addressing nearest neighbor statistics and the letter functions, the K function. And finally, we came down to a focus on the actual cluster, the local statistic, the local K, or the local joint count.
In the next uh, set of slides, we'll take a different perspective that is not based on statistics, but is based on, um, if you wish, machine learning, which is density-based clustering. See you then. Bye.